Culture. Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm your host, Federica Bressan, and my guest today is an advocate for transhumanism. He is also a journalist, author, entrepreneur, libertarian futurist, and was a reporter for National Geographic. He speaks to me from California, where he lives. His name is Zoltan Istvan. Welcome, Zoltan. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Basically, you now travel the world and speak about transhumanism. For those who don't know, what is transhumanism? Absolutely. Well, transhumanism is a social movement of now tens of millions of people around the world that want to use radical science and radical technology to improve the human being and also to improve the human experience. It can be anything from exoskeleton suits that get disabled people out of wheelchairs could be things like brain implants and uh, tell you know interfacing directly with machine intelligence with your own thoughts and it can also be something like genetic editing where people are trying to put plant dna into their skin so that they can photosynthesize from the sun and get energy that way and replace eating so it's anything that's radical technology Excellent. So my question was precisely, oftentimes we hear transhumanism equal to just achieving immortality, defeating death. I wanted to ask you, since you often talk about this having superpowers, enhancing the experience of being alive, enhanced vision, and not just vision which we have, but um, possibility to do photosynthesis, for example, how does that relate to just the one goal of achieving immortality? Well, yeah, the number one goal of transhumanism is definitely, at least in the near term, achieving immortality through science and technology. And you can do that through either reversing aging or stopping aging with perhaps genetic editing where you can change the DNA of human cells that you know want to age. Or you can do that through replacing body parts. For example, most people, well, about a third of people die from heart disease. So a lot of companies out there that are transhuman are trying to create artificial hearts, bionic hearts. And you can also do that through even, you know, achieving immortality through, um, you know, kind of crazy stuff like uploading your brain into a computer. And there are numerous companies now that are putting hundreds of millions of dollars into this type of technology in where I live in California, Silicon Valley. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways to achieve a much longer lifespan. Because this is literal. This is not metaphorical. This is not I will live forever through my children. This is I get to live as long as I want or forever because that's a distinction. Sometimes people are scared by the concept of forever. But I heard you say, what about just extending our life expectancy and then at some point switch off but when I decide? Well, yes, you know, sometimes I will say the word forever or sometimes I say the word immortality. But, you know, as a science-minded person, I don't really mean that. And that, that you know, this is just uh, speaking very freely because I don't really know if I want to live forever. I, it's hard to imagine I want to die. But what I'd like to say is I would like to live a thousand years or 500 years. And that's what a lot of people think is realistic, at least right now, given what we know about the universe and how fast technology is evolving. But I think for the short term, what we're trying to do is, you know, basically it works out like this. Technology is improving so quickly right now, you know, based on Moore's law, where the microprocessor is doubling every 18 to 24 months approximately in speed and size, that if you live a year, you probably gain a year based on how much technology and science there is out there. And so that means if you can live another 10 years, you're going to gain 10 extra years of life just because medicine will be able to keep you alive because it's gotten so much better in that time. Now, if you can live 20 or 30 years, you almost certainly will be able to live 500 years just based on the trajectory, uh, how fast modern medicine is evolving and the new types of technologies that will be out there in 15 to 20 years time to keep you alive. Yeah, about medicine, is there a qualitative difference in the approach that medical research has now and what transhumanism pursues? You know, it's about getting rid of a disease or just fixing a body. Is it different? Because now the heart implants the pacemaker, for that matter, uh, which is not perceived as something alien or foreign, you know, in your body, whereas some skepticals will be afraid of what are you talking about, chips in your body or cables in the brain? It's hard to, to draw a clear line between these two things. So medicine is already extending our lives. I mean, seriously, it's probably a bit of a radical statement. But if you really think about everything we consider as medicine, including what we know about hygiene, 75% of us wouldn't be around. 
Now, so how is medicine approaching this life extension issue differently than transhumanism would or is doing? Sure. Well, and that's completely correct. What you said about, you know, just even medicine today making us live twice as long. You know, the average lifespan in 1900s was about 40 years of age. And now, of course, Mm -hmm. the average lifespan is mostly, you know, in the mid 80s about or a little less. But either way, it's doubled from 1900s. And a lot of that just comes from basic uh, hygiene and and the aspirin and the the fact that we don't die from a cavity anymore. In the 1900s, you could still die from a cavity, something as simple as that. But, you know, this is a great question you ask about how medicine versus transhumanism treats healthcare differently. And I can tell you that the big pharmaceutical companies out there that literally run the healthcare system treat medicine very differently. They are not looking to make people live indefinitely because they make their money off fixing ailments. Whereas transhumanists, you know, I mean, transhumanists, we don't say, oh, let's, you know, have a, uh, some kind of medicine for cancer so that you can live better before you die. We say, How can we eradicate cancer 100% so that there is no more cancer on planet Earth? Very similar to how we would say that with polio or other major diseases. We look for vaccines with cancer. We want to get rid of cancer, you know, forever. And I think that's quite a different approach than the big pharmaceutical companies. Because obviously, if (laughs) if a cancer drug company got rid of cancer, it would also be out of business. So this is a problem with our modern medical system where, you know, transhumanists, we don't look to cure heart disease. We look to replace the heart entirely so that you have a machine heart that has literally zero disease, literally zero pumping uh, malfunctions. You've been involved in transhumanism for many years now, and it, it all started, you, you tell this story, when you had a philosophical nuclear bomb when working with the bomb diggers in Vietnam. Can you tell that story a little bit so we understand how you grew into this movement? Sure, sure. Well, you know, so I, I became interested in transhumanism in college, and I'm age 45 now. So, you know, already at 18 and 20 and 22, I was reading books and very interested in them. In you know, I, I, when you're a young kid in college and you realize there's a movement out there that wants to overcome death with science and technology, it's wonderful. It was, I became immediately attracted to it, wanted to be kind of dedicate my life to that. But after college, I began working at National Geographic um, as a journalist. And um, some of my transhumanist ambitions were put aside because I, you know, I got this amazing job. And I was covering a lot of war zones and a lot of, diff, uh, you know, kind of very, I guess, dangerous issues. So I had one issue when I was in Vietnam covering uh, groups of people that were undigging unexploded bombs in the forests and the jungles. And, um, you know, these jungles in Vietnam, because of the war there, even 30, 40, 50 years later, are filled with landmines. So it's very dangerous work, including for a journalist just to cover it. And I had a very close call with a landmine. And I was about... 30, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe 35 years old when that happened. And after that incident, I, um, you know, very close call. I just said, kind of sat there and said, I'm, I'm done being a journalist and I'm done doing dangerous things. I'm going to now dedicate my life and all my resources and all my energy into transhumanism and to living much longer. And, you know, at the time I'd been writing wonderful articles for National Geographic, but it wasn't directly related to transhumanism. So what happens after my time in Vietnam, I came back and wrote the novel, The Transhumanist Wager, and that went on to become a bestseller, and it did very well, and um, it really sort of launched my public career in the transhumanist movement, and ever since then, I've been uh, pushing forth, I guess, in very many media circles, the idea of transhumanism and trying to convince the American public, as well as the world, that um, this is a, a movement that we have to put our money, our resources, and our time behind because everybody's life is at stake. This isn't just for transhumanists. I mean, transhumanists is one of the most humanitarian movements out there. We're trying to make everybody live a lot longer and a lot better. So since you've been involved in this long, well, long enough, and you say technology actually changes every year almost now, I wanted to ask transhumanism in its concepts, how, if, has it changed since 10, 15, 20 years ago. What's amazing is how fast transhumanism is changing today and every year now just because of technology. The movement itself started in the 60s and I, well, I guess it started in the 80s, you know, in, in real terms, in terms of philosophers getting together, saying this is the word we're going to use. This is a concept. Here's a philosophical basis for it. But of course, the word's been a little bit older, 20, 30, uh, I guess 1920s, 1930s, it was used for the first time. But 
More importantly, in the last 10 or 15 years, the movement has been catching on because the science has been catching on. But even just 15 years ago, talking about transhumanism, talking about robotic arms connected to the brain was science fiction. Now, all of a sudden, you know, there are thousands of people out there with robotic arms that are connected to the brain. And the reason is, is because, you know, there are thousands of amputees and people that have been hurt in war zones that need these kinds of limbs. So what was once a a movement somewhat based on science fiction and the promise of the future is now based on reality, now based on the idea that it's very possible human arm could be replaced by a better bionic arm within five years. And we're already experimenting on amputees. And this is, you know, transhumanism is really about merging into machines because that's where a lot of the longer life will be because machines, of course, don't wear down like biology does. And it's also, you know, this kind of idea that one day we can be completely cyborgs or robots and perhaps even upload into machines and we would have very different experiences and be much more, um, I guess, much longer lasting. You're a bit of a bionic man yourself because you do have a chip implant in your hand. That's correct. Yes. I mean, this is a tiny thing, but yes, I do have a chip implant in my hand and start a car. It can, uh, it opens my front door it allows me to not have keys. It's quite, it's quite a fun thing to do. How long have you had it? I've now had a three years. And the funny thing is this, the chips already obsolete. Like, This is kind of one of the problems with putting technology in your bodies is that the technology develops so rapidly now that, you know, if you put in a chip implant in your hand in 18 months, you'll have to replace it with the new modern one if you want to have all the new upgrades. And of course, this is going to be a problem with bionic hearts and robotic eyes as well, is that, you know, by the time, uh, you know, when they start putting in this stuff, the technology improves so quickly. But, you know, we will probably become like automobiles at some part point where, you know, if you want to replace your engine, yeah, you go into the doctor, they do it really quick. And then in three years, you get an even faster engine. And um, you can kind of see a human being like Formula One racing where every part is interchangeable. Does having a chip implant qualify as biohacking? Yes, yes. So biohacking is really the part of transhumanism where mostly young people are trying to do already hacks to their biology. And a lot of people, it's not only technology, it's a lot of the genetic editing is considered biohacking where they would, um, you know, try, like I mentioned earlier, they, they'll take DNA or plant DNA and try to inject into their system in hopes they might be able to create, uh, you know, in their own body, something like plant DNA where they could photosynthesize and get energy from that. Now, no one's had success with that, but these are what biohackers are experimenting on. They're experimenting on, you know, HIV vaccines and things like that, that very few uh, or, or not as many of the, you know, I guess academic or, you know, universities are doing yet because it takes so long to go through human trials. But biohackers just skip all that and do it on themselves. How does one get a chip implant? And I assume it's legal, uh, right? Well, frankly, it's it's not that it's even illegal or legal yet. There, it's such a new technology, and this is the case with many new technologies, that it hasn't been approved. In fact, in some states, it is, I think, downright illegal because you're not allowed to modify your body without permission from the medical, you know, government medical association, which we generally call the FDA. But these chip implants are not FDA approved yet. So basically, you get them on the black market. These chips go in through a syringe. They're so small that you actually inject them into your system. And you can do it on yourself or you can go to like a tattoo shop and they'll inject it for you. They only cost around $30 or $40 now. They're very inexpensive. Some of the more sophisticated chips um, cost, you know, hundreds of dollars. But either way, they're pretty much all shot into yourself through an injection. So the main issue is finding somebody who will do it to you. Well, you know, a friend can do it as well. You know, it's really easy to do, or you can even do it on yourself. But I think it's wise to have somebody who's experienced do it. And part of the problem is these are so small, you don't want them to get dislodged and end up in some other part of your body. Yeah, I'm not suggesting anybody at home should try this. But I think that I can honestly say I'm very interested. I mean, I was interested in biohacking a little bit recently. I got involved in some communities and I realized that all my courage and boldness kind of went away when it was time to inject something suspicious in my body. But this chip, I mean, by now it seems safe enough. So this is probably just an indicator that I am, um, that my fantasy goes wild when I hear you talk about transhumanism and what is already possible, but also the possibility that this opens up. First of all, I like very much that you talk out of 
love for life. This is why we want to stay alive so long. There is a love for life fundamentally there. Yes. And, and, you know, one of the great statistics I try to tell people, and this is what I think a lot of people don't realize, is that if transhumanism and if, you know, the radical science movement is able to stop death or stop aging by the year 2030, which many experts think could be possible, I'm not saying it will be, but it could be, if we can stop death by 2030 versus, let's say, the year 2050, in that time, we could save the deaths of one billion people. We've never had such a humanitarian social movement as transhumanism ever that literally is trying to stop people from dying on such a massive scale. We're not talking about stopping, you know, a few thousand people from dying a year. We're talking about stopping 150,000 people from dying a day. And this is why transhumanism is such, and I believe, is going is catching on so quickly is such a viable social movement and is such a humanitarian movement is because we really are trying to eliminate suffering from people you know in in general suffering in any sort of way and especially death something else you've been saying in order to promote transhumanism goals is money redistribution in a smart way meaning take it away from activities such as financing wars and put it into the science even into the medicine, you know, what could we do with that kind of capitals? So if big money was actually put on the science we need to get to achieve immortality, that time span of 30, 40 years could actually become very realistic. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, I mean, the reality here is, you know, America, for example, let's just take America, we spend 20% of our GDP or our domestic product on war, <laughs> on bombs, on bullets. And um, we spent less than 2% on science. And if we were just to even put 10% of the war money into life extension, I can virtually guarantee within 10 years, humanity would have found a way to live indefinitely and stop aging. It's really a matter of money. The, the human body is a machine. Uh, you, we must understand that, you know, our brain is three pounds of meat on our shoulders. That's what it is. You, you can call it whatever you want, but it's just three pounds of meat. We need to find a way to improve these body parts. And we can only do that by spending a lot of money on the research and a lot of money on the universities and a lot of money on the private companies working on this stuff. And the government has to be there to help out. And um, fortunately, when it decides to fight wars in Afghanistan instead of fighting wars against cancer – everybody loses. So a huge part of my, you know, political platforms, whether I ran for the presidency in 2016 or running for governor in California in 2018, was reducing the military industrial complex and increasing the science industrial complex. Let us just take money from the military and put it directly into science. It's not like the country's losing any money. It's just changing the message. And the message is the citizen's health matters more than anything else. Transhumanism so is about achieving immortality with technology and science. Now, when you speak, you're often criticized with many different arguments. And I uh, agree with some, mostly not. But one thing that can certainly be said is that defeating death sounds like a grandiose statement. So I'm afraid that because of this, grandiosity, the whole movement can be easily dismissed like you've read too many science fiction novels or come on. I understand a positive discourse around technology. We can do amazing things. God knows what we can do in the future, but defeating death like sounds too much. I want to ask, is there actually evidence to reasonably believe that this is feasible through science and technology? Oh, 100%. This is a great question because a lot of people actually say, okay, here you are coming talking about curing aging or stopping death, but what proof do you have? Well, in the last five to seven years, various studies, various research has been going on proving that all this can be done. For example, we now have multiple studies on mice where we have stopped aging or at least been able to rejuvenate their cells to a point where we can get mice to live almost twice as long as their normal lives. And, you know, the problem here is that we have the government saying, okay, now you're ready to take this to other animals and then to human trials, but such a process takes 10 to 15 years because 
we're talking very complex chemicals and solutions and therapies. So these studies have already been done and these chemicals and these pills and these kinds of essentially uh, fix-it solutions for stopping aging are out there, but they're just taking forever to get through our federal drug administration. And, um, and that, that's you know, that's the proof in the bucket. The proof is already out there. It's really getting it through to the point when you as a consumer can go and buy a therapy or a shot or a certain kind of pill that makes you live longer. That said, a few anti-aging pills have already hit the market that show great promise. And of course, other things like bionic organs are already out there. There are already by people using bionic kidneys, of course, different types of heart valves, bionic hearts and stuff like that is a French company that entirely is trying to replace all the heart. So there's so much proof in the system, but the real problem is that there are like literally a dozen companies out there working on this stuff, but all of them are kind of mired in these government trials that take, you know, 10 to 12 years to really get through the system before you might actually start seeing it. And then there's all the new companies doing all the real radical research. You know, that stuff you're going to be hearing about in five years, that will take another 10 years to prove after that. But yes, there, there are so much science. There are now billions and billions and billions of dollars in the pipeline feeding into this machine of trying to get you to live a lot longer. And the proof is way beyond. There's no one's questioning this anymore. The real question is how soon will we start seeing these kinds of therapies out there where you can walk into a doctor's office and get a injection that will make you live an extra five to seven years. And that's coming. Are you worried at all about whether we have enough wisdom to manage all these possibilities? It's not to give you a hard time. It's actually because it rarely comes up in your speeches. You're attacked more like, what if this happens? What if that happens? But even if everything goes well, in fact, this is like superpowers really. And humans are clumsy, you know. Will we have the, the wisdom to manage? Is it even a factor that is discussed in the transhumanist movement? It's not just technology, 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 but then who are we, what we do, you know, how we behave to each other and the rest of the environment? You know, these are things that are discussed all the time, but they rarely hit the media because they're not that exciting. And the truth of the matter is, I'm not the best person to ask about the worries of transhumanism or the critical points because I'm an optimist. I go out there and promote it all day long, and I talk about the wonderful things. Of course, transhumanism has its critics, too. People say, oh, you know, think about the movie Terminator. It didn't end well. Or, you know, what about eugenics? Is, is transhumanism going to turn into eugenics? And we all know the bad history of eugenics. But, you know, in the end of the day, technology and science – have largely been responsible for improving the world. I mean, the reason that people live a lot longer, the reason people live a lot better, the reason we have more prosperity across the world, the reason that we don't die from just simple things like cavities is because of people that push radical technology and science forward. And we believe that all the science and technology that's coming out now from transhumanists are going to make the world even better. But of course, you know, there's some caution that always has to be built into the system. And, um, you know, I'm glad that there are critics out there that balance me out because I'm only out there screaming from the rooftop saying how beautiful and positive this is. But we also need a good balance of criticism. Well, yeah, I will dare say this. In fact, I feel for you sometimes when I hear you attacked on so many um, future scenarios. What if this happens? What if that happens? Because it's just too easily reflected in, like before we had cars, what if everybody has a car? Then we will have accidents. Then people will not walk anymore. They will become fat and have heart disease. I mean, it's just so easily attackable, but now we have this technology and it's just a matter of the use you make of it. It's not bad in itself. So you're an optimist and it shows. And sometimes it must feel tiring a little bit to just receive this sort of easy criticism. I feel that if somebody a word to criticize the movement should find you know more subtle arguments than that because the car example i think perfectly relates to what if one day you know yeah yeah first off i think for me and i mentioned this in you know in this interview is that america is 75 percent quite religious they're quite christian and if you believe in christianity very deeply then you know that you know christian religion is based on dying and meeting your maker, meeting the creator in heaven. Well, transhumanists are mostly secular people, and they're mostly people that say, well, we really don't believe in a maker, and we also have no reason to die. Now, of course, these two ideas, these two philosophies go directly against each other. And a lot of the criticism that I find in transhumanism comes from people that are religious saying, you're doing God's work, you're taking God's power away, or you're trying to play God. 
But the reality is we're not trying to play God. What I'm trying to do is I have two daughters. I have a wife. I have a mother. I want to protect them. And I have neighbors and I have family and I care about the human species and I don't like to see anybody suffer. I'm trying to create a social movement based on real science and real technology that can help lives and make it so that human beings don't ever have to suffer or have to suffer dramatically less. And uh, that's really what transhumanism is about at the core. But of course, as we get into this very modern world where technology is becoming so complex and so sophisticated, I think um, a lot of people are getting afraid of what it means to lose our sense of humanity. But I keep telling people, we're never going to lose our humanity. What's going to happen is we're going to gain better parts of our humanness through technology, and we're going to take our humanity with us. It's not like we're ever going to become these evil, giant machine creatures that have no soul. We're going to make the best of all the different worlds. I suspect that when the technology is there and a religious person is on his or her last day, mm, you'll have a line outside of your facility. Those moments, I think that, you know, when it touches you, you change your mind. Maybe, maybe. But our time is running out and I cannot let you go without asking you about this exciting expression that's quantum archaeology. It seems to me like the next step, the frontier, it's not just about keeping alive the people who are currently alive, but it's about bringing people back to life or what, what is 3D bioprinting? Well, so quantum archaeology is kind of the frontier of transhumanism, if you were going to imagine it like that, the undiscovered land. Basically, there's two different facets of quantum archaeology. The first is that 3D bioprinting, we're already capable of basically printing cells out of human beings. And in 50 years time, because of the evolution of the 3D bioprinter, we'll probably be able to print out the entire human body. And that's incredible. But more importantly, the other facet of quantum archaeology is the idea that physicists are getting so good at different types of you know, experiments, including the God particle and other different types of uh, their experiments, that many of them feel that with enough AI or enough server power, computing power, we might be able to reverse engineer certain parts of the universe. For example, you would take 100 square miles of the planet and just reverse engineer all the subatomic particles, all the subatomic activity that has happened. I mean, after all, that's a computational, you know, an algorithm, essentially. It's a computational mathematical formula to reverse engineer how something happens in matter. Because in the end of the day, we are all these, you know, quantum quarks and all these other things running around. Now, if you combine those two fields together and you are able to reverse engineer parts of the universe, that means you would be able to reverse engineer even including people who have died in the past. So, for example, if you've lost a father or if you've lost a grandmother, There is a possibility in 100 years' time with enough computing power, we would be able to go back, reverse engineer whatever, wherever they were and whatever they were like, perhaps right before they died, and then 3D bioprint them out exactly that because we have the configuration of what they were like. Now, that's what quantum archaeology is. Now, there are entire transhumanist groups out there that want to 3D bioprint every person who has ever lived on planet Earth and bring them back to life. Now, again, this is the fringe of transhumanism, but it also is an incredibly – it's almost like a religious idea yes. because it's almost like the afterlife, and it combines the theology with transhumanism. And I like the idea because I also think there have been so many tragic deaths in the past. Think of all the people that died of the plague. Think of all the children that have died, people that never got to live out their lives or never experienced existence. So there is some humanitarian aspects of really – bringing back anyone that has ever lived and asking them, would you like to live again? Would you like to live longer? That's the power of transhumanism. And I'm not saying I support this necessarily because this is very, this is so many different problems and, you know, overpopulation and ethics involved. But it's great to mention about where transhumanists are when they're thinking about the frontiers of transhumanism. That's what quantum archaeology is. Yeah. Even if it wasn't feasible, it just a great idea to have. And speaking of great ideas to have, in an interview, you were asked, what's the most beautiful thing in life or on earth? And I loved your reply. You said, to have an idea that nobody had before about how to help other people. Sure, sure. Well, that, that's a good one. There's, a, you know, I, I think I get asked questions at the end of my interviews quite often. I, I give sometimes different answers. 
But honestly, in my opinion, if someone asked me, what is the best thing? What is the most beautiful thing you can do on planet Earth? I would say to come up with the idea of saving lives, a new idea that nobody else has ever thought about. That is perhaps the most altruistic, the most heartfelt, the most innovative thing that you can do. Change and help their lives with something that no one has thought about. And you know, I, these are the kinds of things that a lot of transhumanists are working on day in and day out. That's why they're scientists and engineers and technologists and futurists. They're trying to come up with the next best way to help people, help humanity. I thank you so much for your time and I wish you good luck and just keep doing what you're doing because I think it's, it's inspiring. Uh, whether one adheres 100% or not, it's inspiring and it's with a humanitarian cause underneath. So thank you for being on Technoculture. Oh, it's my pleasure. It was great to speak to you. Thank you for listening to Technoculture. Check out more episodes at technoculture-podcast.com or visit our Facebook page at Technoculture Podcast and our Twitter account, hashtag Technoculture Podcast.